I took his introduction. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get treated with five years of experience. <laughs> Yeah, that's 55 years old. It's great to see so many people here, uh, like-minded people. Um, some people like to uh, meet their uh, favorite sports hero or their favorite actor or actress. I like to come and, and uh, listen to my favorite uh, speaker from the John Birch Society. Uh, our speaker today was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. He received a Bachelor's in Science and Physics from Holy Cross College. Served his nation as a Marine Corps officer and began a career as an electronics engineer in 1960. In 1966, he left the engineering profession to accept a full-time position with the Society. Working closely with Robert Welsh for many years, he was named the Society's Public Relations Director and its official spokesperson in 1973. He has appeared on many major media, C-SPAN many times, spoken from platforms in all 50 states, and has been, on, and has been the subject of interviews conducted by Pat Buchanan, Larry King, Judge Andrew Napolitano, and many other radio and television hosts. Uh, he also spoke at Ron Paul's Rally for the Republic, addressing more than 12,000 attendees. His dedicated service led to his 1991 appointment as president of the John Birch Society, and is currently writing a book, uh, currently writing a book on the history of the society and its battle to save America with his wife, Mary. He resides in Wakefield, Massachusetts. Not only has he been a heavily sought after, effective speaker. He is also the, also the author of five books and countless pamphlets, booklets, and magazines. One of his books, Financial Terrorism, Hijacking America Under the Threat of Bankruptcy, laid out in 1993 the very economic dilemma we later experienced in 2008. He has written Changing Commands, The Betrayals of America's Military to the UN. In his highly popular paperback, The Insiders, Architects of the New World Order, he provided conclusive evidence that the five presidential administrations were dominated by individuals dedicated to global governance who, who were working against our form of government and were destroying our great nation. In William F. Buckley, Pied Piper for the Establishment, ex he exposed the key figure in the advance of the neoconservatism movement in America. He is the author of the booklet-sized publications, Dollars and Cents, and the Restoring the Rights of the States and the People, JBS, Myth vs. Reality, and the UN in America. John's highly acclaimed video pre presentation, An Overview of America, has been viewed by millions of our citizens via DVD and YouTube. I highly recommend anyone that hasn't seen it to get one of those, D uh, one of those DVDs today and watch it and spre uh, spread that message to your children. <laughs> Over the years of service to our cause, John has specialized in guiding and educating Americans with clearly written and spoken words. We sincerely thank him for his lifelong dedication to preserving economic and political freedom in America. So let's warmly and enthusiastically welcome our featured speaker, John F. McManus. I want to thank you for reading it exactly as I wrote that. <laughs> You know, it's funny, I get introduced all across the, the country, and, and usually they, they will mention that I graduated from Holy Cross College, uh, and then it, they want to say what city it's in, and you ought to hear the way people demolish Worcester, Massachusetts. <laughs> but one time I was introduced by a guy, and he said, uh, I think you maybe all of you have heard of the rambling wreck from Georgia Tech. Here's the total loss from Holy Cross. <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen, and I want to thank Chris for playing it straight here. I, I, did, didn't. Now, I, have, I have a long speech here, and I wrote the whole thing out on this piece of paper. Right. This is the whole, the whole speech. But I, I wanted to start, I want to start off a, a talk with a, a little bit of humor if I can because we get into some serious subjects here. So I wanted to talk to you about three fellows who wanted to go to the Olympics and it's a good time to do that because the Olympics are on right now, right? So these were, these were fellows from, uh, from, from Britain like uh, Peter Gallo 
and Britain and Scotland and Ireland, right? So <clears throat> they got all the way to the Olympics where they were being held and they found out they didn't have enough money. They couldn't get in. So as the Irishman said, we conceived a brilliant plan. <laughs> there was a construction project going on nearby. So the British fellow, I think his name was Throckmorton or something like that, I don't know. He, he went over and he picked up a pole, uh, a, a big long pole, and he walked up to the gate and he said, Throckmorton, Britain, pole vaulting. <laughs> and they let him in. Right? So, so one of the other fellows was a Scot, a Scotsman, and his name was McGregor. So McGregor, he, he went and he found a, a metal disc, it was probably a small manhole cover or something, and he cupped it under his arm like this and he walked up and he says, McGregor, Scotland, discus, and they let him in too. So now it was the Irishman's turn, Murphy. Well, Murphy, he found a, a little place where they had some barbed wire, and he, and he got a piece of the barbed wire, and he went up and he said, Murphy, Ireland, fencing. <laughs> <laughs> and they let him in, too. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's move ahead here. Now, now we want to get serious. Uh, I hate to spoil all the fun we're having here by, by getting something serious, but, but we have to do that. So let, let's talk about the United Nations. Let's try to expose the United Nations. We want to talk about how we entered, why we should withdraw, right? <clears throat> there are commonly held attitudes about the UN that are all wrong. They're all wrong. The first is it never accomplished anything. It's a forum for just blowing off steam. Needs to be reformed. You don't reform cancer, do you? No. <laughs> Must get better leaders. But they feed hungry children. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they feed hungry children. Right? The feeding of the hungry children is always giving the money to the government, and then the government uses it to advance its power. You know? And then it's a place to talk rather than fight. You've heard all these things, right? But <clears throat> the most oft-repeated attitude is is this one, the UN is a place to talk rather than fight. Well, if you, if you have 193 nations in the UN, and that's how many there are, 193, and you've got two countries that are having a squabble, one with the other, you take it to the UN and now you've got 193 people in the squabble. Doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Right. And, and, of course, if our country is involved in one of these squabbles, don't we have an ambassador in almost all of these 193 nations, right? My attitude about many of those ambassadors is they ought to bring them home, right? right. Bring them home. The second most oft-repeated attitude is that the UN never accomplishes anything. But the UN employs tens of thousands all around the world. Are we to believe that those UN workers are doing nothing? Let's, let's take a look. Here's the United Nations headquarters down in New York City. How many in this room have ever been there? Quite a few of you. Ah, good. You'll be pleased to know that some members of the John Birch Society who live in New York City went to the UN on October 24th, UN Day, and passed out John Birch Society literature to anybody who walked by. Right. We certainly support <laughs> We certainly uh, thank them for that bit of initiative. Now, the UN doesn't accomplish anything. Okay, here's the UN's International Monetary Fund in Washington. That's a pretty big building, and all those people in there are in there doing nothing. <laughs> right? They're very busy at doing nothing. Right? Here's the International Labor Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Right? That's a pretty good-sized building, full of people, and they're not doing nothing. Right? Here's the uh, World Health Organization in Geneva. Uh, these are huge buildings. And they're full of people doing something. Right? Uh, here's the International Criminal Court in The Hague in the Netherlands. Here's the World Bank. We're back in D.C. again. Here's the uh, well, other large offices. We have 
the Food and Agriculture in Rome and the Seabed Authority in Jamaica and the Atomic Energy uh, Agency in Vienna, Maritime Organization in London, UNESCO in Paris, plus agencies and organizations in Tokyo and Bangkok and Montreal and Nairobi. They're all over the world doing nothing. And if you believe that, I have some uh, stock in the Brooklyn Bridge I'd like to unload. Right? <laughs> now, let's, let's very quickly remember our own country. The Declaration of Independence is our birth certificate. It says men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted. God's on top. He gave us our rights, and we formed a government to protect those rights and nothing more. Right? How about the UN? Oh wait, let's go, go on a little bit. We go to the Bill of Rights, which is part of the Constitution. Congress shall make no law regarding God-given rights. Right? It's not what, what our, our country, you know, I, I tried hard, I have a friend who used to work for Donald Trump, and I tried hard to get a message through to him during the campaign while he was campaigning to make America great again, and I said, all you have to do is say over and over again what's on this one piece of paper. And all it said was, America became great not because of what government did, but because of what government was prevented from doing by the Constitution. Can you imagine how many Americans would have cheered that? It, it would have even converted some of the millennials, some of the liberals, some of the, some of the, the, the people who never got it figured out, right? Well, anyhow, we didn't succeed in getting the message through to him, but we tried. Right. So Congress shall make no law regarding god given rights. Okay, now let's go to the UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it says much of the same things that we say in ours, but where did those, uh, where did those laws, where did those rights come from? Right. Here's an example. Everyone shall be subject only to such limitations as are determined by law. By law? You mean if the UN proclaims it, they can cancel it? By law? Exactly, right. They say that in their Universal Declaration. <coughs> Rights may be subject to certain restrictions, but these shall only uh, be such as are provided by law and are necessary. Again, by law. So the UN can cancel any right, and the U.S. Constitution says, no, you can't. Right? No, you can't. Could there be a bigger difference? There's enough reason right there to get out of the UN. The Constitution of the Soviet Union is exactly what the UN became. Right? They say the same thing. No God, rights come from government, and can be canceled at will. So we see polar opposites. On the left, we got the United States. With God, rights from God, and no law can cancel. On the right, we see the United Nations. No God, rights from government, and you can cancel every right by law. Right? Anybody want to get out of the UN? <laughs> Where did it come from? Well, the architect of the United Nations was a man named Edward Mandel House. And he, he was a Texan a political manipulator working in Texas, he was responsible for four governors in a row down there, and then he decided to look a little bit higher, so he moved to New York City, and he befriended the governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson. He wrote a book called Philip Drew Administrator, and in the book, he starts off with a, a quote from Giuseppe Mazzini. Most of you have never heard of Giuseppe Mazzini. But he was an arch-conspirator. He was the successor of Adam Weishaupt in the conspiracy against mankind. Right? Uh, I know a lot about him, but I'm not going to talk much about it because we've got to move ahead. Uh, Edward Mandel House, in his book, cited Massini, and then he advised Presidents Wilson and FDR, and then he wrote in his book that he was dreaming of socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. What do you need to know about Edward Mandel House beyond that? He advocated the income tax and the Federal Reserve. We got both during the Wilson administration. He proposed world government. He launched the Council on Foreign Relations. 
I consider him the arch conspirator of the 20th century. In 1919, the Senate was asked to vote to join the League of Nations, and they said no. They debated the matter for nine months, and they said no. Now keep that in mind, nine months, no. We'll see what happens when we get to the UN being considered, right? I recommend very highly Jim Perloff's book, The Shadows of Power, supplies the answers about who and why and what to do about it. Uh, it's the history of the Council on Foreign Relations. Excellent book. Now in its 18th printing, by the way. Thank you. All right. All right, let's move ahead in history now. We see in December 7, 1941, there's a picture of what happened at Pearl Harbor. So immediately we were into the war. Within 30 days of Pearl Harbor, our diplomats weren't worrying about Japan. They were worrying about how to get the United States into the United Nations. Right. One month after Pearl Harbor, they, formed, they formally had a declaration of the United Nations. It's the first time the term was ever used, United Nations. In 1943, the U.S., the U.K., that's the United Kingdom, England, USSR, and China agreed to form a world government. Now, this is while all the fighting's going on, right? Most Americans are concerned about their husbands, their fathers, their sons, their uh, uh, in, involved in the war, and here are these people planning to take advantage of the war to build a world government. In 1944, there was a conference held at Dumbarton Oaks. That's a, that's a, a huge facility in Washington. It's a, an estate that's been converted into a place to have meetings. And they created the initial draft of the UN Charter. 1945, San Francisco Congress, four, 50 nations went to the San Francisco Conference. It produced the final UN Charter, and uh, they brought it back to Washington, and, and the, the U.S. Senate started debating it. Right? The war in Europe ended on May 6th of 45. They called it VE Day. The Senate approved entry into the UN during July of 1945, and then Japan surrendered after we had entered the UN on August 14th of 1945. The founding of the UN, the U.S. delegation had 16 secret communists, one of them being Alger Hiss, who was the Secretary General of the founding conference, and there were 43 members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Was the deck stacked? Of course, right? Were there any good Americans among the delegation? I don't think so. I've never found any one of them that I could say was a uh, hardcore uh, American uh, uh, backer of Americanism. The chief authors of the UN Charter were Vyshinsky of the Soviet Union, who was an open communist. There's no doubt about him. And Al Hiss of the U.S., who was a secret communist. He wasn't known to be a communist at the time, but he was. In 1945, the Senate voted to join the United Nations. They debated the matter for six days. Remember what I said about the charter for the League of Nations? They debated for nine months and said no. And in 45, the Senate voted after two days of deliberation, six days of deliberation, they voted to approve the UN Charter. That got us into the UN. Now the vote was 89 to 2. Only two senators said no. Only two senators had studied the charter. Right? Uh, and of course the, the two senators are well known. Everybody in the room knows of William Langer and <coughs> Eric Shipstead, don't you? Right? You may have heard those, turn, those names for the first time today, right? Shipstead was from Minnesota. And I dug out the speeches that each of them gave as uh, during those two days of deliberation, six days of deliberation. And Shipstead at one point said, control of the war power must remain in Congress. He saw that it would no longer be in Congress. Langer from North Dakota, he said the UN would have the authority to send our boys all over the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have troops from the United States in 130 nations. Sometimes small delegations, sometimes thousands of people, right? There was a diplomat named J. Reuben Clark, 
who was instrumental in helping some senators vote against the League of Nations in 1919, and he was still alive in 45, and he tried to, again to talk to some of them, and they didn't, they didn't want to listen. The charter is a war document, he told them, not a peace document. It makes it practically certain that we shall have future wars. It removes the power to declare war, and choose which side to be on, determine the equipment, and command our sons who do the fighting, right? Absolutely on target, right? But they didn't listen to J. Reuben Clark. Now, you might find it surprising that 89 to 2 was the vote in the U.S. Senate, right? I can remember those days. I'm old enough. When that was happening, I was 10 years old. My father was always interested in political matters, and he... He uh, unfortunately got sucked in, I remember. The attitude was, we had World War I, we had World War II, we don't want to have World War III, we've got to try something new. We've got to try something. Let's give the United Nations a chance. That's, my own father was saying that. And of course I was too, a 10 year old, and I was saying, okay, good, it's okay by me, you know, let's give it a chance. That's how they sold it. They sold it to the people, they sold it to the senators, they sold it to the press, because a lot of the press was very much in the pocket to begin with. Right? So let's look at the charter. Here's Article I of the Charter of the UN. The document, by the way, the Charter of the United Nations is not as large as the Constitution of the United States. It's very easy to see. We ought to reprint it and make it available to people so they can see it. Article I, the word peace appears six times so the UN insists it's a peace organization. Article two authorizes war. Well, make up your mind, will you? Are you a peace organization or are you a war organization? Right? The UN Charter in Article two discusses application of enforcement measures under chapter seven of the, of the uh, Charter. And chapter seven authorizes Demonstrations, blockade, and other operations by air, sea, or land forces of the United Nations. All of that is war, right? It's not a peace organization. If you don't go along with the UN, they retain the right, the power, to go ahead and bring upon you war. Now here's Article 25 of this UN Charter. Uh, would you agree to it, all right? Read along with me. The members of the United Nations agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present charter. That's the entire Article 25. Would you have signed that? If you were a United States Senator, would you say, all right, we are, we are duty bound to accept and carry out the decisions of the Supreme that, Court? That trumps the Constitution. I have to stop using that word Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Source of where would the UN get the military forces? It says 43, all members of the United Nations undertake to make available to the Security Council armed forces, assistance, and facilities, including the rights of passage, necessary for the purpose of maintaining international peace and security. All members of the United Nations. So the United Nations decides it's going to start an operation in the Sudan, in Somalia, right, in uh, wherever and all nations are required. Do all nations <coughs> provide troops? No. Who provides most of the troops for the United Nations? The United States, the United States right. All right. His former Secretary of State, Colin Powell, this is absolutely bonkers. He said, with respect to U.S. policy, when it comes to our role as a member of the Security Council, we are obviously bound by U.N. resolutions. He actually said that. He said that uh, outside the, the UN at a press conference that he had soon after he became the, the president. You may remember back in, in 2001, uh, George W. Bush had just become president because the Florida uh, election hadn't been decided. <coughs> it, took, it took quite a bit of time and they, they went all the way to the uh, beginning of, of 2001. So Colin Powell was only in office a few weeks when he went up to the UN and, and bowed and scraped before them. Here's George H.W. Bush. 
is the sacred principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter to which the American people will henceforth pledge their allegiance. Sacred principles, right? Is, is that a little bit over the top? A little bit? Yeah. Now there's something else that hardly any American knows anything about. It's the United Nations Participation Act. The charter was signed and, and became, uh, we became a member of the UN in July of 45. In December of 45, the United Nations Participation Act was passed. And the United Nations Participation Act says the president shall not be deemed to require the authorization of Congress to send troops to enforce Security Council resolutions. Right? That uh, any American would sign that? Well, there were some uh, objections, right? Here's a, a female congresswoman from Illinois, Jessie Sumner. She was a, a good, good American. She said, this measure gives congressional authority for surrendering the American people to an all-powerful world government. Absolutely. Right? Here's a, another congressman, Dr. Fred Smith, a, a medical doctor. <coughs> he spoke out about this Participation Act. The measure strikes at the very heart of the Constitution, he said. It provides that the power to declare war shall be taken from Congress and given to the President. Here is the essence of dictatorship. Right. So the House of Representatives voted to uh, consider the United Nations Participation Act, and look what the vote was. 344, only 15 Members of the House of Representatives voted against it. And the Senate approved it by a voice vote. It is now being used, but you never hear it mentioned. Right? Uh, what does the Constitution say? Only Congress can declare war and send our troops into a war. Only Congress. That hasn't been done since the days after Pearl Harbor. And you know what else? After World War II, we haven't won a war. We've been involved in Korea. We've been involved in Vietnam. We've been involved in, in Iraq. And now we're in Afghanistan. <coughs> 17th year in Afghanistan. 17 years. Robert Taft of Ohio, one of my dad's favorites. He was a great American, but he got sucked in on the UN. He voted for it. He was one of the 89. And then he discovered what really was happening and he said the UN is a trap, let's go it alone. And he fought against the UN. Now within the charter of the UN, you have a section called regional arrangements. It's articles 52, three and four. And it's the authorization to form NATO and CETO. The Security Council shall utilize such regional arrangements for enforcement action under its authority. Security Council shall be kept fully informed of activities. Right? So the Security Council of the United Nations knows what NATO forces are going to do before they do it, and that's why there have been so many casualties for the American troops. Right? Secretary of State Dean Acheson, bad man, really bad man. NATO is an essential measure for strengthening the United Nations. He said that, persuading U.S. senators to vote for approval of the NATO, the NATO pact. And they did. So NATO was created in 1949. Derives its authority to exist from the U.N. Charter. Only th 13 senators, led by Taft, voted no. And NATO, with 28 member nations, is now in charge of the Afghanistan war. And 17 years we've been in Afghanistan. Is there any timetable to get out? No. Okay. Uh, you will hear military people complaining about this or complaining about that. <coughs> I've never heard one of them complain about the fact that they're under UN control. Are they? NATO's in charge, NATO is UN. Yes, our troops in Afghanistan are on the United Nations command. About the Korean War started in June of 1950. 
North Korea invaded South Korea. UN Security Council said all members send troops to stop the North invading the South. UN supplied bulk of the troops and there was no declaration of war. So some good journalists went to President Truman and they said, where are you getting the authority to send troops? There's no declaration of war. He said, we're not at war. Oh, oh. Tell the families who lost a son or a husband. Right? We're not at war, he said. This is a police action. He said, if I can send troops to NATO, I can send troops to Korea. You see how these things are used, the, the multiplication of, of wrongness. So UN flags were flying during the police action. State of war still exists. U.S. troops still in South Korea have been ever since. All of them in the U.N. command, and most of them have no idea that that's the case. Right? Even some of the, the high-ranking uh, military personnel don't understand what, what they're involved in. So the Korean police action, General George Stratemeyer led some troops in the Korean War. The bulk of the shooting stopped in 1953 after three years, and, and he testified before the Senate, as did other generals. Stratemeyer said, you get into war to win it, you do not get into war to stand still and lose it, and we were required to lose. We were not permitted to win. Right? <clears throat> General Douglas MacArthur led our troops. He was eventually fired by Truman. <clears throat> What was his crime? He got a letter from the Speaker of the House, who was uh, Congressman Joe Mo uh, Martin from Massachusetts. And he responded to the letter. And that's what they fired him for, for responding to a letter he got from the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Right? There were people who would tell you that MacArthur violated laws. He, 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 uh, he, he refused to do what his superiors wanted done or something like that. A lot of baloney. MacArthur had won the war and then the Chinese communists invaded. In his own book, Reminiscences, General MacArthur quoted the Chinese general who led all those troops. Those troops came over from China. They outnumbered our forces 20 to 1. Right. And the general, Lin Piao, the Chinese general, he said, I would never have made the attack and risked my men and military reputation if I had not been assured that Washington would restrain General MacArthur. Right. Right. Who, who restrained General MacArthur? Diplomats like Dean Acheson and... At, at this point, it was, uh, it was President Eisenhower. So he was assured that Washington would restrain General Mc... Who, who gave that assurance? The United Nations did. Then there's the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. NATO was such a success for the bad guys, they decided to do it again in, in, a, in a different way. So they, they started another... Uh, a, a duplicate of NATO called CETO, S-E-A-T-O, created in 1954 by John Foster Dulles. Uh, if you don't know much about John Foster Dulles, what you may need to know to start is that he was one of the founders of the Council on Foreign Relations with Edward Mandel House. And CETO was cited as authorization to place U.S. troops in Vietnam. Were they allowed to win that war? No, no. President Lyndon Johnson said we are in Vietnam because the United States and our allies are committed by the CETO Treaty to act to meet the, communist, the common danger of aggression in Southeast Asia. Right? That's baloney. Right? Vietnam War rules of engagement. I pried these out of the congressional record. Uh, Barry Goldwater finally in 1985 obtained the rules of engagement that our troops had to fight under and put them in the congressional record. I, I got 17 pages of them. And they were, don't, don't attack enemy planes on the ground. Don't attack truck co convoys if they pull off the highway. Don't close Haiphong Harbor where the main supply, supply was coming in from West, Eastern Europe. And Goldwater said these rules unquestionably denied a military victory. Absolutely. 
no doubt about it. The first Iraq war. Now we've gone through uh, Korea and Vietnam. Now we're into Iraq in 1991. Papa Bush, the first President Bush. The Gulf crisis has to do with a new world order. And that world order is only going to be enhanced if this newly activated peacekeeping function of the United Nations proves to be effective. Right? Huh. Was it effective? You bet your life it was. But the war stopped suddenly. We had tremendous numbers of forces in the, in the Middle East. And, and <clears throat> they succeeded in getting Saddam Hussein's forces out of Kuwait. And then the war stopped. And people were scratching their head. Why didn't they go all the way to Baghdad and get Saddam Hussein? Well, the Security Council authorized only forcing Iraq out of Kuwait. So they didn't violate the United Nations requirements, right? And it, <clears throat> the war was fought to strengthen the United Nations, and it did. The second Iraq war was in 2003, right? Led it to the Security Council from U.S. Ambassador John Negroponte, 21 March 2003. He started the letter off by saying, the actions being taken are authorized by existing council resolutions including 678 and 6787. In other words, they waited till they got authorization from the UN before acting. Now, there's a principle involved here, and this is it. The principle says one seeks authorization not from a superior, not from an inferior. If you need authorization, something in your, the company you work for or something, you don't go to the guy who sweeps the floor. You go to the superior if you need authorization to do something. The United States goes to the United Nations for authorization to carry out war. This is intolerable. And yet, how many Americans understand that? <coughs> well, we're making progress. We're getting that message out to more and more all the time. The Afghanistan war, I've already said, it's under NATO. 17 years still sustaining casualties, waiting for the UN's permission to leave. We can't leave Afghanistan until the UN says it's okay to leave. So, summary of all the UN wars. Korean War, UN flags were flying, no doubt about that one. Vietnam War with CETA, Desert Storm, UN authorization. Second Iraq War, UN authorization. Afghanistan War, NATO's in charge, right? <coughs> Ron Paul's motion. The second war in Iraq started in March 2003. Six months before that, this is October of 2002, there was a meeting of the House Int International Relations Committee. Ron Paul's a member of that committee. He said, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. What's your motion, Ron? I move that we declare war on Iraq, and I intend to vote against my measure because I don't think we should go to war against Iraq. <laughs> but I also don't think we should ignore the constitutional requirement for a declaration of war. Good for you, Ron. So what happened? <sighs> Chairman of the committee, a guy who was touted as a great conservative leader, Henry Hyde of Chicago, he said, Ron, there are things in the Constitution that have been overtaken by events and by time. Declaration of war is one of them. Your measure is inappropriate, anachronistic, it isn't done anymore, and that was the end of the discussion. <laughs> right? Now there were some members of the Birch Society in the Chicago area, where Henry Hyde is from, and they wrote to him and they asked him if the part of the Constitution that says he shall be paid a salary was also an anachronism. <laughs> he never answered. He never answered. <clears throat> In 1961, the State Department issued State Department Document 7277. I could spend a whole half hour talking about this. Talked about the gradual turnover of the military to the United Nations. And to disarm the citizenry. It, it says at the end of this document, in stage three, disarmament would proceed to the point where no state or person would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened UN Peace Force. That document, a copy of it, somebody in Washington, and we don't know who it was, it came in an unmarked envelope, right? 
It came to Robert Welch, head of the John Birch Society. He looked it over and he said, oh, we got to get more of these. We got to spread these around. We got to get the people to be aware of what this is all about. So he did, directed one of his subordinates. I wasn't there at the time. I wasn't even a member in 1961. Right? But what happened is he wrote, the guy wrote, and they got back another box full of them. And they said, okay. They went quickly, get another box. They finally <clears throat> were told by the State Department and then it's out of print. <laughs> but it's a public document, it's a government document. So Robert Welsh said, okay, we'll print our own. And we did. And we have published tens, <clears throat> tens of thousands. And it's still available, you can get a copy. It's not only disarmament of nations, it's disarmament of people. In 1962, Professor at MIT over in the Cambridge Mass, a member of the CFR named Lincoln P. Bloomfield, he wrote, a world effectively controlled by the United Nations. And he said, if you're going to have a world effectively controlled by the UN, you have to have total disarmament of civilians. You, membership in the regime, far from being privileged, would be mandatory. Now, th this, this kind of stuff's going on. Gun foes want Civilian disarmament. Yeah, oh yes, they do. Yeah. There's a fellow named Barack Obama. He wanted it, right? See the pistol? That's at UN headquarters, the entrance, outside the main entrance in the courtyard, right? A pistol with the barrel tied in a knot. It's very clever, right? right? Very clever. You know what's interesting? That is not a military weapon. That's a Colt 45. And so what they're saying is disarm the people. The UN is very much in favor of that. Now, that ought to be enough to have every member of the NRA said, get out of the United Nations, right? Gun control, Mrs. Mark says, Senator, Senator Feinstein of California. She shoots off mouth, hits foot. <laughs> Now, one other aspect of the UN is very interesting. The Article 2, Paragraph 7 said, Nothing in the present charter shall authorize the UN to intervene in matters which are essentially within the jurisdiction of any state. In other words, if you've got something going on within your borders, it's none of the UN's business. But does the UN meddle in? Yeah. Here's a United Nations flowchart. This is something I picked up when I went to the UN headquarters guy was passing them out. I said, can I have two? Can I have seven? You know? He gave me as many as I wanted. And then we'd come home and we made hit it the copy machine. Right? The UN's tentacles, as evidenced by what's on that chart, put, published by the UN, you find the UN tentacles in education, population, children, women, environment, trade, finance, health, and on and on and on you go. Everything! The UN has authorized itself to do anything. <laughs> so, there's a UN refugee agency. Who decides how many refugees are going to this country or to that country? Well, the UN does. Right? Happily, there's been some blockage of them sending tens of thousands more immigrants into our country. But the UN designates who is a refugee, and it proposes which country must accept them, in 2016, Obama said he would accept 85,000. In 2017, plans were laid to accept another 100,000. That hasn't happened. But it probably would have happened if Mrs. Clinton had won the election. So the UN is intervening everywhere. Katanga in 1960s. Rhodesia, destruction of a nation. Australia, they stopped the hydroelectric power plant. Guatemala, they demanded that Guatemala change its constitution to allow abortion. The European Union destroys the sovereignty of all those nations. International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and so forth, meddling everywhere in violation of their own charter that says they have no jurisdiction within your borders. Right? So they're a lawless organization as well. Are they intervening in the United States? Yeah. They've spoken out about 
any prohibition against abortion in this country. They stopped mining projects up in Montana. They are against capital punishment and have spoken out about we have that and we should stop. Border control, they don't like border control. Well, up till recently, I didn't like border control either. Right? But it at least now seems like something is being done about it. There are fewer people coming across the border. They, 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 they condemned judicial decisions of our courts and they are, of course, opposed to the right to be armed. Here's a lawyer from California who, who said, someday it will be malpractice for lawyers to fail to include UN human rights law in their cases. Right? That's the way we're headed in that one. The cost to the US, just in the year 2010. Figures are hard to get, right? So I had to go back to 2010 to find out it cost us $7.7 .7 billion to be a member of the UN and all the programs, and, and that's not all of them. They didn't add in the, mil the, the military obligations that we accept and, and the very expensive cost in lives and in treasure. Agenda 21 is a, a plan to take control of everyone's life. Right? This is a, a, a document this thick. It came out of the Rio conference in 1992, was it? And <clears throat> it starts off with a foreword written by a pro-UN lawyer named Sitars, S-I-T-A-R-Z, S-I-T-A-R-S, I guess. He said, Agenda 21 proposes an array of actions which are intended to be implemented by every person on Earth. <laughs> every person, right? Effective execution will, acquire, will require a profound reorientation of all human activity. Uh, all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced, right? Do we want that? No. <laughs> Agenda 21, so we put some information out about it, and the move towards implementing it has been slowed down, right? <clears throat> Agenda 21 is a stealth operation. They don't even tell you that it, what they're doing comes out of Agenda 21, and it has <coughs> it has divisions within the book about property rights, family size, water rights, civil liberties, waste disposal, food, transportation, energy, education, well, the whole thing, right? Complete reorientation of all human activity, right? Globalism for your children, yeah. Common Core, right? Common Core and UNESCO. Our goal for the coming year will be to work closely with global partners, including UNESCO, to promote qualitative improvement and system strengthening. Arne Duncan, who was Obama's Secretary of Education. Right. Happily, he's not there anymore. So what do we see? The three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic have now been replaced. It's now recycling, racism, and reproduction. We, we started a campaign against Agenda 21 and scared the wits out of them, so they changed their mind and now they have it uh, Agenda 2030. Agenda 21 was to implement the entire program of that thick book by the end of the 21st century. Right? But now they decided that they better speed up the project, and so they have a new version of it called Agenda 2030, which means to implement the entire program by the year 2030. And that's only, what, 12 years away? Right? <clears throat> the European Union, originally only a trade agreement, became the European Economic Community, later named the European Union. In 2004, it grew to 25 nations. 2013, it's now 28 nations. The U European Union had a draft constitution, which was subservient to the UN, and it said so. They sent it to the states for ratification. French and Dutch voters rejected it. Good for the French and Dutch voters. They rejected this. So the, the promoters of the whole scheme substituted a treaty. And they gave that to the leaders of nations. And the leaders of nations went ahead and approved the treaty. So the UN... The EU, European Union, you hear a lot about the European Union. I don't know if you know it, but your money bailed them out 
of a financial crisis in 2012, the United States dollar bailed out the European Union in 2012. Now here's, here's a, a somewhat mind-boggling uh, entry of religion into the, into the picture here. What you see here is a poster produced by a, United, a, a European Union uh, commission. And on the left, you see a painting by a Belgian painter named Bruegel in the 1600s. Right? It was his depiction of what he thought the Tower of Babel might have looked like. Right? I'm assuming that you know that the Tower of Babel is discussed in the book of Genesis, right? So that's his painting on the left. And on the right, you see the, U the European Union deciding to rebuild the Tower of Babel. And you can see construction men there. You can see the crane and so forth. And what they're saying is, not God's will, ours. We're going to build a tower to go to heaven and challenge God. <laughs> Incredible. Now, you see above here from funny looking stars. They're not stars. They're pentagrams. That's a, sim that's a satanic symbol. I mean, are we fighting against uh, political forces? Yes. Are we fighting against economic forces? Yes. Are we fighting against God Almighty? Yes. Yes, these people are fighting against God Almighty. Right? They have the TPP, and thank goodness President Trump decided, no, we we're not going to be part of the TPP. I won't go into it. <coughs> The Refugee Commission, former correct uh, Comey. Then they have also the Trade and uh, Investment Partnership, TTIP. The TTP was for the Pacific, the TTIP was for Europe. Right? And we're still negotiating that one. Now here's a, a good example of what some of these people are. I think most, most people have heard of Jacques Cousteau. That nice little Frenchman, he travels around in the oceans and he's got his little boat, the Calypso, and he's, he's really a very gentle man, he's a nice man. Look what he wrote. He wrote this in a UN publication. It's terrible to have to say this. World population must be stabilized. And to do that, we must eliminate 350,000 people per day. Per day. To get down from 7 billion on Earth down to one billion. Okay. So nice little Jacques Cousteau is a savage. That's what he really is. The key, get us out. Robert Welsh said you throw the United States from the United Nations and you have broken the back of the world conspiracy. Right? Conspiracy? Okay. Right. a man named James Lucier. I didn't put his name up there. I should have. He said the first job of conspiracy is to convince the world that conspiracy doesn't exist. Right? That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So you go to a friend, or you go to a neighbor, a co-worker, somebody you met at church, or and you start talking about some of these things, and invariably, somebody will say, you sound like a conspiracy theorist. Have you had that happen? Yeah. You're not a conspiracy theorist. You're a conspiracy factist. And that's the way to answer those people. <clears throat> conspiracy sure does exist. Robert Wells said there's a conspiracy at work as sure as there is a law of gravity. Uh, nice summation. Nice summation, right? So let's conclude. America's leaders are not stupid bunglers. They're not lacking information. Ergo, conspiracy. Conclusion number one. The United Nations is not taking over the United States. What's happening is the United States is being delivered to the United Nations by our own leaders, by our own media, by our own Hollywood stars, right? We gotta stop them. Conclusion number two. 
Membership in the UN is completely incompatible with an independent US and freedom for the American people. I hope that energizes you. I hope that gets you to want to say, okay, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to get some of that information over here on the book table. The little booklet that I wrote about the United Nations, right? It's only 50 pages. I gave that to a fellow who admitted to me after he found out I was in the Birch Society. He said, I always thought the Birch Society was a bunch of screwballs. <laughs> Dangerous, even. I said, well, read the pamphlet and let's talk about it next week when I see you. He came in and he says, I couldn't put it down. Where have I been? There are many, many people like that. And who's going to reach them? Each one of you is, is going to reach them. Reach them with that little booklet. Reach them with the shadows of power. Reach them with, with something else that we've got on that book table over there. So what should be done? Should the UN be reformed? Should the US just reduce its payments? No. That's what Nikki Haley has just uh, enthused about. We cut our, substance, our subsidy to the United Nations by 5%. Get with it, lady. Should the UN have a new Secretary General? Well, the new Secretary General happens to be a guy from Portugal who used to be the head of the Communist Party in Portugal. Surprised? No. I wasn't surprised at all. There's a billboard. Get us out of the United Nations. I think this is the one that was in Arizona between Tucson and Phoenix. And I was in Tucson one time and I was being driven back to Phoenix and I told the guy, are we going to go past the billboard? He said, yep. I said, well, when you get there, I said, stop the car. I want to get out and genuflect. <laughs> he did, and I did. <laughs> so what do we want? I got House Resolution 1205. It's now, what is it, 193? 193. 193. Th that was introduced by Ron Paul, who retired from the House and now... Mike Rogers of Alabama has introduced the same bill, exact same wording. And I want to tell you a quick story about that. Where did that bill come from? Well, there's a girl that I know in the Birch Society. She's a graduate of our summer camp program. She's now in her 50s, right? And she writes some for our ma magazine. And <clears throat> She's a terrific young, young person. I say anybody's 50s young to me, but anyway. <clears throat> when Ron Paul won a chance to go back into Congress. You may know that he served for a bunch of time and then he quit for a while, tried to become senator, lost, and went back to doctoring, and then he came back into the Congress. Right? When he came back the second time, it was quite a struggle. She called me the day after he got back into Congress, and she said, I'd like to work for Ron Paul. Can you help me? I said, are you willing to move to Washington? She said, yes. I said, okay, I'll do what I can. I had Ron Paul's home phone number. Ron and I have always been good friends. I called him at home, congratulated him on his victory. Without even me saying a word further, he said, I couldn't have made it if it hadn't been for the Birchers. He knows. Okay. He knows. So the young lady went to work for Ron Paul. She stayed there, I think, eight years. And I asked her one time, I said, what did you do all those eight years? She says, oh, I answered the telephone and I wrote some letters and I squired people around the building and I, I did a lot of different things. And, and she says, and I wrote one piece of legislation. You did? You wrote one piece of legislation? Which one? She said, to get a South Bill. Uh. I said, how did you do that? She said, I called over to the uh, uh, Library of Congress and I asked in the name of Ron Paul to send over everything that had ever been get us out of the United Nations, any bill that had been introduced over all the years. She said, I got a stack of stuff. So I went through it and I picked out this and I picked out that and I picked out that and I put together the bill and I gave it to Congressman Paul and I said, would you please consider entering this into the Congress of the United States? He said, well, let me look it over. He gave it back to her the next day. He changed one word. <laughs> one word. What he changed was she had said immediately, and he said, give him two years to pull out. That's all the change he made. A member of the John Birch Society wrote the bill.
Next time somebody says the Bird Society's never accomplished anything, remember that. So there it is. Now there are co-sponsors. It should be, again, 193 at the top. Duncan of South Carolina, Duncan of Tennessee, there are two Duncans. Hooth's Camp of Kansas, Massey of Kentucky. Massey of Kentucky is the successor of Ron Paul. He's, the, he's a great, great congressman. Westmoreland, Yahoo, and of course Mike Rogers who introduced the bill. They need a lot more co-sponsors. So what about the Birch Society? Well, you get rock solid information. You got five decades of experience. You got sorely needed national organization. You got a plan for victory, right? What's the plan in a nutshell? Inform ourselves and others, understand the enemy, educate and activate friends, grow membership, train leaders, change the voting record or change the congressman, restore constitutional government, maintain vigilance. Right? That's what we do in the John Birch Society. So if you're here and you're not a member, I hope by now you're saying to yourself, I gotta be a member of this organization. I, they need me, I need them. I want to join the society. Talk to Kip Webster, talk to Ed, talk to me. I'll be glad to sign your application. <coughs> There's my booklet, United Nations Exposed, 50 pages. Remember my friend, who's now a good friend, who said to me, I couldn't put it down. There's one right there. <laughs> I'll even autograph it if you want it. I'll put my real name to it. <laughs> So the commonly held attitudes are wrong. It's not a forum for blowing up steam. It's not a place that never accomplished anything. The United Nations is like a, a slowly seeping, oozing menace to your home, to your livelihood, to your country. Right? And it, it, every day that it exists, it gets closer to its final goal which is total domination of the planet. Right? It's not that it never accomplished anything. It's not that it needs better leaders. It's not that it's a place to talk rather than fight. So the choice is ours. Less government or world government. U.S. Constitution or U.N. Charter. God or no God. There's never been a God at the United Nations. A better world or a new world order. To achieve victory, we need more members in the society, and there's an application blank. We have them for you tonight, today. Come join us in our proud companionship and in our epic undertaking, said Robert Welch, over and over again, right? The man who became almost a second father to me. I was close to him, and I was very pleased to be there. One of his sons is still alive, a good friend of mine, a member of the council of the society. And uh, I see him occasionally, and, and he's a good fella. So there we are. John Birch Society, thank you for listening. Thank you very much.